during the course. So uh, concepts. So I always think about webinar or uh, landing pages in terms of like, who are we making this for? Why are we making it? And then the last thing, what do we want the audience to learn, do, or like leave with? So those are sort of the three things I always think about in terms of concept. And I kind of work my way from the top and then all the way down to the bottom. And it, and it sort of just rolls my entire thought process through a landing page. So when I think about who, the first thing I'm usually thinking of is my ideal customer profile and my persona. Now, some people may know more about one of this and some people may know more about the other. So uh, basically, I would separate it by ideal customer profile is kind of the firmographic profile of your most ideal customer. And then the persona is the person within that firmographic, within that ideal customer profile that you're speaking specifically to with your um, content. So when I think of ideal customer profile, um, I think about the things that it would, that would tell my salesperson, my, my sales director that like, yes, this is a really good customer for us um, prospectively. So uh, when I worked at Benzel uh, for the welding, uh, for the welding equipment manufacturer, things that I thought of immediately for ideal customer profile, we were really big in automotive and we were really big in heavy fabrication. Uh, we were also were very account based. So we wanted like, like big time global style um, companies. So the first thing I thought of was, okay, do they have at least 25 welding stations? Do they have 25 robotic stations? Um, do they have multiple locations throughout the US? Um, are they in certain industries? So are they in automotive? Are they in heavy fab? Do they weld thick metal? Um, do they need water cooled welding? So like think about those questions about those companies that you want to sell to and what would tell your salesperson, yes, this is a really good fit for us. We should absolutely be selling these, to these companies. So I personally always recommend making something called a red, yellow, green matrix. Um, you can look that up, I believe by Mark Robert. She wrote a book called the sales acceleration formula. Um, highly recommend reading that, but basically it's just like a nine point plot where you come up with all of the different firmographic details of your ideal customer. And then it, it's basically just a easy picture of, okay, they fall within these categories. These are great customers for us. We should be going after them. Um, I'd also recommend, cause I've seen industrial companies do this. Don't overcomplicate this. Don't think you need like, they need to fit 20 different criteria to be an ideal customer. You really should be thinking about the three to six things tops. Um, so try not to overcomplicate it for yourself and, and, and make yourself be fast doing these sorts of things. And then on the persona side, like talk specifically about to a certain person. And usually that person's going to have one thing that they care about more than anything. Yes, they're going to think about a bunch of other different possibilities, but like, honestly, like you, you have that guy, that technical Terry, that budget Betty, where like Terry's focused on the technical details of the project that has to work technically. Budget Betty, she probably works in purchasing. She's worried about payback period and ROI. Um, so think about when you're thinking about content, think specifically about who you're talking to within that firmographic. So when I think who, um, uh, hi, hi, Jennifer, how do you know about things in their internal operations? Like number of robotic welding stations. So normally what I would do um, in, in, a, uh, in a scenario like that is definitely I'm looking at how much that company is doing globally in revenue. Um, and that's usually giving me a clue in. Um, sometimes it's even like, I would just go intro myself to somebody on LinkedIn. And, um, and then I would just, I would frankly just ask them sometimes. I would go to tell me a little about you guys operations. Or another thing I would do is on my form when I was, they were downloading a piece of content or if they were going to uh, put in a, a sales request, I would just ask them right there, like how many welding stations do you have in your company? And if, and they would usually tell me the number and then that would give me an instant clue as well. So those are things you could either take care of in your inside sales process um, or you can take care of it in your marketing process and just like make those qualifying ICP relevant questions part of your lead gen strategy. And, and by the way, just, just one note, a buyer persona is not a, a picture, a stock image of whoever you think this is and talking about they have two dogs and three kids and what they eat for breakfast. Like that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about very specific insights about who these people are. Like Matt said, how many welding stations do they have? What, are they, what problems are they facing? What do they care about at work that you actually know about? So be very specific about that and think about you know, write the stuff down that's going to help you make landing pages. Don't, you don't have to think about you know, their personal life and things that might not be so relevant for, for this stuff. Axel, I see your question. I'm actually going to get into that a little bit uh, later in my section of it. So hold tight for me. And if it doesn't answer you at all, like just come back in and just say, I want more detail and I will, I will, I will try to tackle it for you as, as well as I can. Okay. Um, so 
then I asked myself, why are you making it? So wh what is the reason why this landing page is, exists? Is it to educate them with content? And content is anything on your website that is a, a blog or a product page or your industry page. Like, are you educating them with content? Are you converting for a quote? So this is your your uh, RFQ page or demo request page, right? Or then there's also like your um, request for information, your RFI page, which I look at as different than quote, um, and, and not everyone does that. But I definitely think about a request as like tech service or drawings, things that would say, you know, maybe this person is in a buying stage, maybe it's an existing customer though, and they're and they're looking to and they're looking to spec things for an expansion or something of that nature. So, um, so if, if I'm so let me just go in order here, um, educate quote or content quote information. So if I wanna educate, so how do you structure the page to do that? Is there storytelling woven in? Like get, get really specific, try not to be so vague about how you're talking about your product or the, the blog that you're, you're talking about. Is your content compelling? Does it meet reader expectations? So that's gonna get into stuff like, and Julian went into it, your headline and your sub headlines. Um, and like kind of how you're, how you're setting the expectation for the content you're gonna have. What are the next steps you want them specifically to take? Do you use compelling visuals or graphics? Like, 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 in, and Randall getting this too with, with uh, stock images, but like, think about if you can use a tool like Canva or something like that to create a little matrix or checklist to kind of give people a visual to, that will summarize the things that you're writing about. Like, those are very powerful things um, that you can use to help A, break up text uh, within your copy and B, give people like, remember people's attention spans are so short, give them a snapshot of what you're talking about so they can immediately comprehend exactly what it is that you're, that you're trying to convey. And then the other thing is like, do you have that call to action? Is it, do you have it multiple times? Like experiment with putting it in a couple different places on your page and use a heat map to see, you know, which one is most effective. It should always be on the bottom. And then you should probably put it somewhere like a third or, or a third of the ways as well on it, especially for a blog. Do you have a call to action? Is it strategically placed? And have you formatted the page to be easy to read? So have you used spacing to your advantage? Are you, are you breaking text up? Again, going back to images, are you using those or, or graphs? Are you using those effectively? Like think about all those. Is it, uh, if it's to convert, Again, how have you designed the page? Is the form easy to find? We did our webinar two weeks ago on Google, Google ads. I can't tell you how many industrial companies I go to and search on Google and go to their Google ads. And the form isn't the first thing I see on the website. Like it boggles my mind. Like go look at any other um, uh, space that's doing Google ads and any good Google ad has the form. The first thing you see on the website is the form. So if you're make, making a conversion page, demo quote, book a call, like that form needs to be the first thing they see on that page. If they have to scroll to find it, they're already out. Like they've already, they've already forgotten about it. So make sure your form is front and center on your conversion page. Um, make sure that you have a little bit of more copy on the, uh, under it. Um, is it easy to find? Are you asking for the information you need and not what you want? This goes a little bit to your question, Jennifer, about like, how do I find out if they're in my ICP? I use that form to qualify them. So you use the form to qualify them. Ask the least amount of information that you need in order to qualify them to pass them to your sales team. And then at that point, you're just iterating. Like anything you make for a conversion page isn't gonna sit in perpetuity. You will always make adjustments. Um, think about using social proof. Like if you have logo customers, like if you have big customers like John Deere or Doosan as uh, a big company, definitely, and they're your customer, like use that social proof and be like trusted by this, this, and this. Like use social proof to help you. You also use it to, to define kind of who your ICP is, right? So like if, if, if you're selling to like big industrial enterprise level people like John Deere, Deuce, and Caterpillar, um, and, and, and little, little Joe Schmo um, and his uh, you know, heavy fab company who has like, you know, three people working for him, probably is like a, is like a third tier subcontractor, probably not going to be a good fit for you. So you're immediately going to help qualify people out as well with, with your social proofs to so think about that. Um, and then also always think benefits, 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 benefits to your customer. Your, bene your customers care about their problems, not yours, and their goals, not yours. So think about the benefits to their customer. If it's an RFI, think about the right information. Are you defining expectations or next steps? Um, have you defined next steps for your sales team or your product team or your engineering team? Go that extra mile, ask them, um, and make sure you're, you're setting expectations for both the person who converts and also for your own team internally, because you don't want any kind of sloppiness happening in that transition, because that's going to ultimately reflect bad on um, your company, but more so also on your department, because you're kind of leading that. So make sure that you take ownership of that in your job. 
of as much as possible. So I want to give a couple of examples of concepts that I really like. Uh, Axel, hopefully this will answer your question a little bit. So machine metrics, uh, check these guys out. Graham Emmerman, who's their VP of marketing, is a genius. He's an extremely intelligent person. So this is an industry-specific page they made. Um, they sell basically uh, data um, homogenization for like CNC machines and stuff like that for automotive for a slew of companies, not just automotive, but like automotive is one of their verticals. Um, and so they have like an automotive specific page. And so I, I want you to look at the language that they use here because I think it's really interesting and it's, it speaks really well to how they conceptualize the page. So automotive manufacturer, excel, look, look at this language, like accelerate, drive, faster. Like they're speaking just directly to these automotive, to, to an automotive OEM and exactly the things that they're thinking of, the, the, the kind of language they project onto their customers, they're projecting it back onto their, to them who's a prospect. It's, it's brilliant when you think about it. So like, definitely think about the language that you're using um, and, and, and put it right back on them because they're going to identify with that instantly. And it's really specific, right? It's not just like, enhance, like increase throughput. It's like, no, accelerate. Like, I mean, just think about how specific and granular you can get with your language that's going to resonate with your audience. And Julian will talk about this as well um, when he gets in the copy. Uh, the other thing about it is the CTA is consistent. So if you look at like this landing page here, like book a demo, first thing you see up top, it'll take you to a form. But look at that kind of deeper content where it says drive value faster and it says learn more. Learn more goes to um, more of like a benefits page, more of a sales page. And then they reinforce that CTA, book a demo, exact same consistent experience throughout the website. So um, definitely think about you know, how your lit pages are linking up and then how consistent you're being with your language across it. So another, uh, definitely something else to consider. So machine metrics, uh, we can put them up in the chat. I'll, I'll put the website up in the chat when, when I'm done presenting here. You guys can check out their website. They're a great template to use for yourself if you're looking for um, if some inspiration. Uh, Firetrace, which is another one. Um, NJ Peters, their VP of marketing. Uh, she's my co-host on my podcast, The Industrial Marketer, shameless plug. Um, <laughs> so MJ does a really great job as well. I want to talk about the language he uses here specifically. Like you have a lot invested in your machines. That, that's budget Betty right there, right? Budget Betty is thinking immediately, you know what? We did invest a lot of money in those machines. And so she's already setting you up to think about, you know, how much like uptime is everything like, and then they hit on that fear. Like, look at that, look at that last sentence they say. Losing even a day of productivity can mean losing a valuable contract or customer. Like, so you have a lot of invested in your machines and losing a day of productivity means, means losing a valuable contract or customer. That is so specific to the problem. And that is something that's going to get your customer, your audience to think immediately, you know what, that's actually a pretty good point. And, it's the, and ultimately, ultimately, they're going to um, intake that specific to their company. Um, the other thing I like about Firetrace does, social proof. They use stats in context. So over 15,000 shops that have decided they aren't taking any chances. You can get back to running your business in as little as 45 minutes. Like this is like, these are really specific stats that they're using to give social proof to their solution. So I'm just consistently impressed by what the, the kinds of things that um, Firetrace does with their content um, as well as with their website. And uh, that's why they kill it on, 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 uh, with, with their website, I mean, they're getting hundreds of thousands of dollars in marketing time revenue every month from their, um, from their website. And I know this because I talked to MJ about it a lot. So definitely check out these guys and what they're doing and how, they're, um, how they talk to their customers and another just template for inspiration. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll get into copy more in a second, but that Firetrace page is, is a perfect example of great copy because the, the thing they do perfectly is they understand who they're talking to and they hit on the problems that these people right. have and the fears that they have about losing machine, about their machines being down. And it's a great example to learn from. I would definitely check that out. Right, I'm gonna rush through this last part here because I've been talking for too long, I think. So once you got the desired outcome, now what do you want to happen? Leave them with a good experience, have that content piece super easy to find if they're downloading something, um, email it also, like give it, like give them two ways, no sales pitch, give them what they asked for. Right, like just like they they obviously wanted to get value from you. Make sure you're you're delivering value and not you know a cheap you know back backdoor sales pitch at the end. Tr try not to do that. Um, request a demo. Great. Confirm you receive that within five minutes. Like seriously, like as soon as possible. Speed to lead is crucial. Set expectations for follow up. If you wanted to have something prepared, ask them on that landing page. Reinforce it on that email, and then set expectations for timing and delivery. Good courses of actions. 
um, such as like, if they register for your webinar, like you should receive a registration in the next five minutes. If not, check your spam folder. If you didn't get it, email this address and we'll make sure you get it personally. So give yourself fail safes all the time um, and set expectations clearly for your customers and you will ultimately leave them with a good experience because the last thing you want to do when a customer converts is let them is allow them to be confused because your messaging wasn't right and your and your marketing operations didn't follow up on it in the way that it should. So audit that stuff for yourself and um, and make sure that you're 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 really tight at that at that part of it as well. All right, Julian, I'm gonna hand this off to you now, brother. Go ahead. Sounds good. All right. Um, I think this section, when you start to actually building the page, I think this section is what's going to matter the most. And no offense, Matt and, and Randall, but like I used to, I used to ignore a copy, not ignore a copy, but certainly not prioritize it. And it's kind of, it kind of blows my mind when I look back at it. And one of my eye openers was this book that I read just six months ago or so that where I really realized, wow, copy actually matters. And again, it's silly when you think about it because like think about the last time that, that you saw an ad or you saw a website that you really connected with. It probably wasn't the design. Of course, the design is a first impression. You see something that you like, it's, you know, it's clean, it's, it looks great. That's, that's, that's great and all, but what you're gonna connect with is when these people understand you, they talk about the problems that you have and they, they show people that they've helped that look like you and, that, that's, and that's all copy. Um, and I think it, it really, this quote really sums it up very nicely. It, it's pretty websites don't sell things, words sell things. So if you want to invest in one thing, when you, when you create your landing page, it's copy, um, make sure to get it right. And in the, in the next few minutes, I've got a few tips for, um, how you make good copy. So let's, let's get into that. Starting with the first one, Matt, if you're going to go to the next slide. I think this is, this is where most people go wrong with copywriting and marketing in general. Um, you need to understand your audience. You need to understand who, who you're talking to. And I love this quote from Dave Gerhardt, one of my favorite marketers. Um, you should check out his LinkedIn, um, follow him there. He's always got great insights. He's also got this marketing group um, that you might wanna check out. You'll find that on LinkedIn. And uh, this, this quote I pulled from lawsofcopywriting.com. By the way, Dave does not pay me to say all this stuff. Um, I wish he did, but if you want to check no, out more Dave. of this, it's actually the opposite. <laughs> What's that? We pay Dave. It's actually the opposite. <laughs> um, yeah, but if you want to check it out, it's lawsofcopywriting.com. It costs a good chunk of money, I think, but it was well worth the investment for me. It's kind of like a lot of copywriting books summed up in one large course. And this is one of the big takeaways. Great copy comes from having a deep understanding of people. And I think, I think back to this whenever I get stuck in writing copy, you know, I don't write a ton because we, we have great writers um, in house that do most of the legwork there. But whenever I get stuck writing, I go back to notes um, that I have for our clients, customers, things that we learn from um, calls with the sales team, things we learn from customer interviews. Um, I go back to those notes and when I get stuck that those things help me get unstuck. And how do you how do you get a deep understanding of people and the people you're speaking to? Um, first of all, talk to your customers. Um, probably the easiest way, and the thing that most marketers don't do, go talk to your customers. Um, if your sales team probably have has connections, they can connect you with people and set up calls. If you can't do that, I know that's sometimes a little bit more difficult to figure out. The next best thing is listen in on sales calls as many as you can. Like just do one a day or you know, more, more than one a day for a few weeks on end. And the things that you will learn and the number of ideas that you will get from that will be well worth your time. So um, do that. And there's probably a few other things. You can go to events you, that they attend. You can you also visit customers too. Like what's that? Visit customers too. If, if you can like try to yeah. go visit them and they're at their place of work, like that's super beneficial because you can see how they um, interact and how they go about their day to day. And right. that'll definitely give you a lot of clues on like the language they use right. and how they think about stuff. Yeah. And if you're wondering, you know, what do I ask these people? You just, you just try to learn about their day to day, try to figure out what do they, what do they do all day and what kind of problems are they running into and how do they use your, your product or how would they use your product? What do they hate about your product or love about it? Just get to know, get to know them, get to know what they do and how to do their job and what they struggle with. 
Um, so that's where all great copy, all great marketing starts here. So if you, if you haven't done that yet, that's where you start with a great landing page. Okay. Next. Yeah, we can go to the next one. Um, yeah, kind of going more in, into detail on these uh, on laws of copywriting. So again, this is a resource um, I, I recommend checking out. There's 10 laws that are in here. Um, we don't have time to touch on all of them, but I want to touch on at least three that I see um, manufacturers and most companies um, violate most often, and I used to as well. Um, so this helped me. This helped me fix it. But um, let's talk about these three here that. I pointed an arrow to them. Number one is you must uncover the selfish benefit. And Matt already talked about that um, with his examples, but you wanna talk about benefits. Like don't talk about yourself and how great you are, how great your product is. Talk about the benefit that your product provides to your, to your customer or to your potential buyer. Um, so you, you don't have to talk about how, how fast your product goes or how it's the best in the market. Talk about how it improves uptime. Talk about how it improves throughput or saves costs or whatever that benefit is. But you know, the people that you're selling to, they, they're selfish. We all are to a degree and they wanna achieve things for themselves. They're not looking to buy it from you to do you a favor. Um, they're trying to get a promotion. They're trying to fix problems that they're having in their plant. Um, so talk about those things. What do, what do you help them achieve? Um, rule number four is you must write like you talk. Um, also, big, big offenders in the manufacturing space. Um, I see a lot of companies write. Um, very technically. What's that? Yeah, very technically, which is okay. You can write technically, but I think you, you, got it. you have to do it in a way that where people actually want to read it. If you write an essay that's, you know, huge blocks of text and it's not addressing anyone in particular, um, it's, it's, it's not going to resonate with anyone. It's, it's going to be very hard to read. I mean, you probably know these websites yourself. You've seen them. You, you go there and you, you start reading and you just skip everything because it's, it's not resonating with you and it's too hard to read. So write like you talk. And you know, that, that kind of follows up on, if you want to check out rule six as well, you must write short choppy copy. So don't write long sentences that run on forever. Don't have huge blocks of text. Make what you're writing um, easier to consume for people because everyone's in a rush. Um, they usually scan copy and if it's huge blocks of text, long sentences, people will have a hard time reading it. So you just want to make it very easy to consume what you're writing. And if it's, if it's too long, it becomes very difficult. Um, last one is number seven. You must be specific. Um, I have a good example for that one um, where one of our one of our customers or one of our clients right now, um, they said we're very customer centric and we have great customer service. And we knew that was true about them. And that came that came out through interviews with their team. We knew this, but what really hit home was when they told the story about the one time they hired or they they chartered a private jet on their own on their own dime to get a part out to a customer so they could get their equipment up and running again. That's how you're specific. You, if you say we're customer centric and we have the best customer service, that's great. But all of your competitors are, are saying the exact same thing. So if you can be specific and probably not all of us have chartered a private jet, but you probably have these stories where you can back up claims with a very specific example. Hey, Julian Axel had a really good question and I want to bring it up to you. Really. <coughs> um, how many words would you advise for a website page? Um, I mean, however many it takes to get the point across. I think be as be as concise as possible. Um, but as long as you're as long as as long as you're not rambling and you're not providing information that they don't need, you can keep going. Like if you if you need to provide a lot of information and they want to know a lot of things, you can write a long page. It doesn't matter because the people need that information to make a purchase. But if the purchase is very easy and you have a lot of copy, then you're probably doing something wrong, if that makes sense. So it kind of depends on what you're selling and who you're selling it to. All right. Uh, one of the things I really like about this, Julian, about this particular is address objections up front. That's something that a lot of industrial companies hate doing. They hate thinking about why people wouldn't like their product. 
um, you will stand out significantly. This goes to Marcus Sheridan's They Ask You Answer, which is a foundational piece of reading at Gorilla 76. Um, if you are the first person in your company to, or in your industry to object, uh, address objections up front, you will, you will disarm your audience in a very effective manner. When we did this for fume extraction at, at Binzel, we made a lot of objection stuff um, because we knew welders hated holding it because they thought it was heavy. Um, and we knew that people thought it was very complex to implement and they had, and they all thought that it sucked up shielding gas, the, the, the welding nozzle did. So we made sure that we addressed those upfront with content. Uh, we addressed it on the way, on the product pages and we addressed it on any content piece that we did webinars or anything like that. So we would educate with that first. And then we'd also just explain how it was a misconception. Um, William, with a really good question, and uh, again, thank you for the context, William, because we can answer it right now. What's more important, telling a great story or what the reader wants to know? How do you make it relevant for them? Ooh, I love that question so much because I think the best writers can do both, both at the same time. And I think that's kind of the, the best copy that I read, they do both. They, they, they convey information while telling a story. And I think it's hard. I think sometimes maybe you want to be a little more straightforward if you're just listing facts, but um, I think the best writers can, can convey that information while also telling a story that pulls people in and they want to keep reading. Yeah, this is such a great question. I love it. <clears throat> and um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I think your point to objections Matt is such a great one because we, we, I hear so many of our clients say, well, we don't want to put anything in, in our customer's head that they're not thinking, but they're already thinking about it. the thing that you're, the things that you talked about, the weight and, you know, I'm not a welding guy, so I don't know these, I don't know these things as well as you do, but they're already thinking that you're not going to put it in their head. They're already thinking it. So you might as well address it. Or worse, yeah. they're hearing it from their peers. So you have way more work to do to, to, to get to, to overcome it. So, I mean, if you're not addressing it, then they're just going to trust their friend who's telling them that already, who may have got that, that information elsewhere. So if they're already hearing it. So, I mean, but you not talking about it is, is, in, is a detriment to you, not a, not a benefit. Um, these are great questions, by the way, guys, please keep them coming. Like I, we, we really love your questions. They give us such, they give us so many ideas. Um, we also, um, they also ch challenge our own thinking. So we really appreciate that. So please keep them coming. Uh, go ahead, go ahead and Julian, go, go with this, uh, this is a really good example from Hay. <laughs> yeah, Matt, Matt asked me to provide some examples um, from the industrial space, but I have a hard time finding them. Um, but I get a lot of inspiration from B2C, especially software, because they, there's just a lot of great marketing happening there. So I, what I would recommend you guys check out for inspiration on copywriting is hay.com. And they, it's like Basecamp um, launched a new email product. And I think they did an incredible job writing copy for that. And this is their headline, by the way, on their homepage, I think, um, is where I pulled that screenshot from emails, new heyday. And I mean, they just launched right into it. Email sucked for years. Um, not anymore. We fixed it. And if we have their website, they talk about the things in email that annoy all of us. Our inboxes are just loaded with so much stuff that is a mix of important stuff of marketing emails, of receipts, invoices, you know, and, and they talk about these problems and they, they talk about the vision about, of making email fun again. And I think it's, they tell a great story and they really get, they really got me hooked. I love their brand. And, and they overcame objections, right? That was the first thing. Yeah. And I mean, their main thing is, um, I love their brand, not because of how they look, but because of how they write, which I think is something that's hard to do. So I would recommend checking that out. Who would have thought your words matter? Um, looks like we got another question from Axel. How can a startup find a good copywriter? I've worked in the past for a company which build websites and I saw that the content was just very bad. I want to um, save that for the end. Is that okay? Because I think there's a couple different ways you can go about that. Sounds good. All right. Yeah, let, let's go ahead, man. Cool. Where's your friend? All right. So design and UX, um, you know, a lot of you probably aren't designers. Some of you may be. So design is probably pretty foreign to you. Um, and there's a lot of mis, like misconception of like what design is for. A lot of people think it's for making your website look really nice and look really pretty. And that is a nice, I would say, like side effect or something that should just be happening baseline as design. 
Um, but design's real purpose is to be done in service to the content, um, to the words that you've worked so hard to write. Design should be propping it up, making it easy to see, making it easy to read, and just letting those, letting that story and letting your content shine. That's the real purpose of design. Um, so always keep that top of mind when you're working through designing and sketching out your landing page and concepting it. Um, where do you start? Start with sketches. So you've probably written some of your copy, you have it outlined. Start sketching mobile layouts. Get a piece of paper, draw a little iPhone screen on it or whatever, make it longer than an actual iPhone and just start sketching it out. Um, why mobile? I'll go ahead and address this anyways. Um, because it forces you to think in a vertical format and really makes you think about the hierarchy of your content. If you have to squeeze everything into a tiny little window and you don't have all this room to play with, it forces you to think what's the number one most important thing I need to say and go down the line there. And once you have that figured out, making desktop designs and sketches should be fairly easy. Um, Make lots of sketches too. Your first sketch is probably not your best idea. Um, so no fidelity, you don't have to be an artist. Just think through the problem at hand and think about what the hierarchy should be, um, what the most important steps you want people to take, what the most important things are you want to communicate and think about chunking that out into scannable sections. Um, because as we said multiple times, people are in a hurry, they're busy, um, especially if you do have to write more words for what you're trying to communicate and it ends up not being very choppy and punchy, you can use design to your advantage by chunking things out visually. Um, even though you might have a lot of words on the page, you can break it up visually with headlines and sections. Randall, I got a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, cause I've, I'm, I'm going to anticipate a question here cause I know this happens and I've thought about this too. What if you're, web traffic is only like 25% mobile. I mean, is it worth prioritizing mobile for a quarter of your website visitors? Yes, it certainly is because um, that number is only gonna grow, first of all. And second of all, it like I said before, it forces you to think in that really thin hierarchy. And if you can get that right, then your desktop design is going to automatically have the same hierarchy. Um, and also another good point is that laptops can be pretty small themselves too. Um, so like someone could be looking at it on like a MacBook Air or a Pixel Chromebook and that screen is pretty tiny. It's almost the size of an iPad. Um, so people are looking at things on all different kinds of screen sizes, even though the traffic may not be specifically marked as mobile. It's really good to think through that. Right. I loved your uh, I loved your point on the sketching. Uh, another thing I'll add to Randall's point on that because I've done this as well. Like once you kind of through like the sketch phase and you want to get a little more advanced, and Randall's got way more advanced tools. Yeah, I'm, through, I'm sure he'll show, and we have um, use like Google Slides or a PowerPoint to kind of break those chunks up for yourself, so you can kind of visually see how that will progress. I've I've done that for for websites and uh, for website concepts, and it's worked really well for me in the past. Yeah, the, the tools that you use don't don't really matter, especially at this first stage. Like you, if you're comfortable using PowerPoint, use PowerPoint to do your sketches. Um, if you don't feel comfortable using pen and paper, what, whatever it is that you're most comfortable working with so you can crank out some ideas quickly, use that. Yeah, we're getting a lot of really good questions here. Uh, let's, I wanna keep this moving because I want Randall to get through his part and then we're gonna get to these questions, appreciate it. Okay. So as you're thinking through your sketches and you're, you're thinking about moving into actually like maybe laying this out um, with some color in the actual words, there's three rules to keep in mind. There, there's a whole load of these at lawsofux.com. Um, not all of them are super applicable to what, what we're talking about here, um, but these three I found, I think make the most sense. Um, so first of all, Hicks Law, the time it takes to make a decision increases with the number and complexity of choices. This just means keep it simple. Don't give people a bunch of options of things to click on or to look at or tons of charts and graphs that are unnecessary. Um, keep it simple because the more choices you give someone, you kind of get analysis paralysis or 
information overload and they'll end up not making a decision and just leaving the page. Um, Miller's Law, the average person can only keep seven items in their working memory. This is the reason phone numbers are seven digits long. It's pretty easy to remember. Um, so if you can, try to keep your page chunked out in seven sections, seven and nine. If you're doing lists of things, you know, keep it short is the idea here. If you can't hit seven, that's fine, but most people can only hold seven things in their memory. Um, serial position effects, so people have a propensity to remember the first and the last items in a series. So, you know, when somebody hits your landing page and they scroll through it pretty quick, or they scan it, what are the things they're gonna take away from that page is the first thing that you said and the last thing that you said. And the same thing goes as you drill down into that page. If you have lists and whatnot in there, like bullet points, um, they're going to remember the first and last item. Um, so some typography tips. To me, the number one thing, like if I'm evaluating like designers' portfolios, like if they're applying for a job, the one thing I look at that sets design apart, like good designers from bad designers, is the typography that they use. Um, and, and that's because the words, so you want to have like a good baseline of typography to make sure that people can read the words that you're writing. Um, and there's a few rules here. Use headings semantically in these visual anchors. Um, this goes back to chunking out your content, making it choppy. Um, and what I mean semantically is if you took all of the headlines out of your page and use that to create like an outline or table of contents, it would make sense. Um, that's how Google reads pages. It's how people with disabilities read pages. If they can't really see very well, they're using a screen reader. It's going to read that page like that. And if you can cater it for those things, it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be easy for someone to scan through your page, read it, and it's going to make a lot of sense. Um, if you're using the heading semantically, your typography should have a clear hierarchy. And again, that's letting people know at a glance what's the most important takeaway here. Um, using things like size, shape, and color. Um, optimum readability. So once you get down to the body copy, you know, where you're writing paragraphs or two or three sentences at a time, there's a general rule of thumb. It's not a hard and fast rule of what's readable and what's not. Um, so you want to keep your line length roughly 50 to 60 characters long, and that's like one line left to right. Um, that's so the person's eye doesn't have to jump back and forth. If it's too long, your eye gets lost, you get frustrated reading it, it seems too dense or something, and you just don't read it. And then another aid in making sure your typography is readable is line height. So your line height is the space between each line, it's sometimes called letting. Um, it should be about one and a half times the font size that you choose. And then what font size is good for body copy? For most devices that people are going to be looking at your landing page on, roughly 14 to 16 pixels font size is pretty good. I wouldn't go much smaller. And if you feel the need to go bigger, I would maybe cap it at like 20 pixels because you don't want everything to scream at you. Um, and then last thing, and this is really important for making sure that your body copy is readable, is use high contrast colors. Um, black copy on a white background is the best for readability, especially when you're talking about people are on their laptops or they're at home or they're on their phones. They're in different lighting environments and readability can become difficult at times. Um, so you want it to be close to black on white. You don't want gray text on an off-white background. It just makes it frustrating to read and makes it difficult to read. Uh, Randall, quick question from Millicent, and I think it's yeah. uh, fitting here, so I want to just slide it in. What do you think of using thematic breaks or horizontal rules? Yeah, um, I think that's really good, actually, because that's that's what I'm talking about when you want to, if, if you do have to say a lot, or even if you don't, and you're trying to create these chunks of copies, so if you're imagining someone scanning a page, and they're not necessarily reading the the content, um, what's going to hook them in as they're quickly scrolling through is those breaks and the thematic rules that you're saying. Um, the, it's, what, it's what's going to be like the anchor for someone when they're scanning through a page. All right. 
Okay, so visuals in photography. Um, Matthew, you kind of touched on this earlier. Don't, don't use images as fluff. Um, they need to be relevant or informative in nature. And if you're picking an image, it should have a purpose other than, hey, this looks cool. It should either like communicate what you're doing to the audience in a really quick way. Um, I think that the, uh, what was the automotive website example you shared, Matt? Machine metrics. Machine metrics. So they had a visual and it wasn't necessarily the hero of the page. It was kind of like in the background, but it was obvious that it was for vehicle manufacturers. Um, and that image did serve a purpose, but it was kind of faded in the back and it was kind of the subconscious use. And, and that's totally okay. Um, if you're going to have a big full color image or graphic up front, it needs to be doing something to educate them or, or sell your product. It shouldn't just be there to look cool. Um, because ultimately, in my next point here, if you have images blocking the content that's really important, um, it's, it's like kind of undoing all the work that you've done on that copy. And definitely don't want to be used, overused stock photography, or generic illustrations that you can get for free online, because everyone else is using them. It's basically the same, same thing as saying, like, we have the best customer service in the world. Well, everybody else is saying that. And the same thing can be said, stock images, like, do some research, make sure other people aren't using it before you use one of those free services. Um, and then one thing that you really should try to do is get pictures of your people in there when video is even better if you can, um, because ultimately this is an online transaction, but people buy from people and you want that human element in there. It's just going to create a ton of trusts, like in a very easy way, just seeing people's faces on your page is going to go a long ways to help. 100%. Even if you're a product led company, like, please, please highlight your people in your in your website landing pages. Yep. And then lastly, here, um, some useful and free tools you can use to design and sketch and mock up um, your landing page, like Matthew said, Google Slides, PowerPoint works, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, this Miro.com and whimsical.com are both kind of like brainstorming digital whiteboard tools, but they both also offer some like wireframe templates and it's very easy to do. You don't have to be a designer. If you can use PowerPoint or Google slides, you can use these tools um, and it can really speed some things up for you. And then if, if you have some experience or you're feeling brave and you want to learn something new, figma.com is a legitimate full blown web design tool um, that's free. Um, for a while. You can do like so many files for free and then you have to pay for it. But it's the cheapest and the most free version of a design software that's specifically for websites that you can get right now. And then this last bullet point here, Instapage, you know, if you want to quickly create a page that is going to look good and is going to force you into like doing some good like design best practices, um, that's going to be the tool for you, but it is not free, but it will take you all the way from design to development to a live page. Um, but again, it's, it's not free, um, but it's a really good tool. All right, Matthew. All right, real, back to you. Yeah, real quick on systemization guys. So um, first thing is create a checklist for yourself for your landing pages. It should be something that you're able to put on like one page, figure out what you want to do. Um, in order to like say this is these are all the elements I need to have in place to have a comprehensive uh, a landing page that's going to meet my needs. Um, we're going to give you guys a template that you can use for yourself. But um, yes, uh, yes, William, uh, to answer your question, we are going to we are definitely going to have that uh, for you guys at the end. And then also as part of your systemization for landing pages, test constantly. Use tools that are available for free that you can you can utilize to help your landing page. So. First one, Google Optimize for your website landing page. You can test any part of your landing page that you want using Google Optimize. You only need to have Google Tag Manager, which is also free. These are all free tools, um, but you're gonna have to get that set up for your website and dropped in. But Google Optimize is awesome. You can test big copy ideas. You can test, you can test kind of um, what copy ideas. You can uh, design elements like, like call to action images or stuff like that. Like Google Optimize is a really good free tool to test. Um, the other one is if you have HubSpot, uh, which we do, 
Um, you can use HubSpot for conversion landing pages, make AB versions of your landing page. And one thing, one lesson I'll give you guys from landing pages, test big ideas, like changing the color of your call to action button isn't really a big test. Think about changing your copy entirely, like write copy completely different than you would otherwise. Or, um, or like, or like reconceptualize the entire page. Like maybe you want to have one that's led by product images and another one that's led by people images and see which one works better. Right? Like test big ideas. AB testing isn't just like, like isolate one variable and test it. No, no, no. Test like the test a big change. And that's where you're going to see the most upshot for your, um, for your, um, uh, for, for your systemization, for your testing. And then the other thing is like ask customers to read your landing pages and give feedback. Um, I, I saw a question about getting your customers to work with you. I know that can be problematic. If you can't get your customers to read your landing pages, then ask your sales team or even, you know, ask someone who doesn't even work for your company or with your company, ask your spouse or your friend and say, Hey, can you look at this and just let me know what you think? Um, you know, people who've never visited your website before are going to have no pre predisposition of walking into it and it will tell you all the things that are confusing to them. And then that's going to give you a huge clue because I guarantee you, your new website visitors are going to experience the exact same pain points. So ask people who you don't know and who don't know your website, ideally your customers, but if it's people outside of your customers, it's fine. Read your landing pages and give you feedback. So those are, those are some things I can give you in terms of some systemization. All right. Essential resources. There's a lot, right? Cash advertising, one of my favorite books ever. I just finished it um, again and I love it. It's all about copywriting and copy that sells. Dave Garrett loves copywriting, building a story by Donnie Miller or Donald Miller. Everybody writes, which is a great tool by Ann Hanley. Randall, I want you to talk a little about that because um, you're not really a copywriter or write copy and you mentioned this book and I want you to tell everyone why. Yeah. So I, I am not a writer and never considered myself a good writer, but um, you know, I asked around the office, what's a good book for me to read, you know, that uh, is going to help me because I want to start writing more content and contribute to our blog a little bit more. And reading this book like gave me the confidence that I need. And it's, it's super clear. It's super easy to read. And like after even just the first two chapters, if you feel nervous or hesitant about, your writing skills, you feel like supremely confident um, because she just makes it super easy and kind of like pulls back the curtain that even the best writers, their first like two or three versions are just total garbage. And that's just part of the process and you kind of need to embrace it. But I highly recommend it if you're a non-writer and you get in a situation where you need to write. Um, it's a super easy read and it's, it's really good. Cool. Um, now let's get into, and then please connect with Randall, Julian, and myself on LinkedIn. And then um, you see our next webinar, which I'm highly excited about, five cutting edge content marketing tactics for 2021. Like I'm going to, we, we'll have some stuff for that. So please register for that uh, when you have a chance. And then let's get into these questions because I know there's, there are some. So let's, um, I'm going to go from like first in, first out. So let's see, we had um, William. So William said that, um, or Axel, excuse me. Axel asked about finding a good copywriter because he's worked for some of the past who built websites and saw that their content was bad. So some suggestions on finding a copywriter. So the freelance route is definitely one way to go. Um, you guys have more, you guys can speak more to this than I do. Um, but another thing you can do is just find like a journalist or someone like that to do your copy for you. Um, they know how to write first off really succinctly they also know how to ask great questions um, and their form of writing is extremely um, acerbic. So they can, they can write in a bunch of different styles based on what you need. Another thing a copywriter can really do well is usually write headlines, which is probably one of the most important things that you know to know how to write as a good headline. So yeah, I would definitely say look for, look to journalists um, who, who, cause they just know writing in a foundational way. Um, and then the other thing is obviously, you know, you can go freelance and, and, um, and, and see if you can find a good copywriter that way. Uh, you know, the bag will be a little bit more mixed that way, but try a few out and see like who's and see whose style is effective and then just, you know, lean into them. Julian, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, it kind of depends on what you're trying to write to. Um, there's, there's a certain, uh, certain group of people that call themselves conversion copywriters. They focus more on like writing landing pages and writing product pages. Like a lot of the stuff that we just talked about, they're extremely good at. 
And I can probably give you guys some names if you're interested. Um, but yeah, like Matt said, I would, if I, if I were you, I'd probably start free, freelance and try to find someone, um, check out their previous work, give them a test project and see how it works out and then consider hiring them full time um, over the long run. That's probably the route I would take. But yeah, definitely lots of, it, it's challenging. There's lots of mediocre writing out there. So I'm definitely get the challenge. Um, let me know if that, that helped you out, Axel, at all. If you have any other kind of things you want to add to that, just pop them in the chat real quick. I want to get to Jennifer's question because I it's a, it's a hard one. Um, my company is always worried about the marketing team contacting customers because they might be annoyed. How do you best make sure to utilize the customer's time given to you? Um, that to me is uh, a tough question. Ultimately, I think you need to, again, frame it in a way that the, benef uh, that the customer benefits from it. So I think you want to basically ask them. Customers actually, especially um, customers who've been using your product for a long time and really like it, they really want to see you do well um, because you've been good to them. So I would just frame that in a way to go to them and say, look, we're trying to get better. Um, and we know that we've done a really good job for you. So uh, I want to, I want to just get, you know, first off, it goes back to setting expectations, which is what I mentioned earlier. Like say it's going to take 20 minutes of your time, um, have five to six questions like queued up. And again, think big picture with your questions. Like you want to get big takeaways from it. So don't try to get too into the weeds. Um, and then listen a lot. Um, and ask open-ended stuff like, like, why, like, well, why do you think that? Or, or what makes you feel that way? Or another question that you should always think about asking to the customer, especially if it's one recent enough is like, what was going on in your life when you decided to buy from us? Like, and, and see how they answer that question. Like, and just, there'll, there'll be probably a little story in there for you to take away. So if you want to make sure you best utilize their time, ask big questions, get right to the point of what you want to know. And again, set expectation. Like, why are you, why are we doing this? I'm doing this because I want us to be better as a company. And we know, I know we've done really good work for you and I want to make sure we're able to do that for all of our customers. So definitely make them the hero and that'll make them much more willing to help you. Uh, and then get those high impact questions and, and ask them and then think about open-ended follow-up questions. And if you do enough customers, you're going to notice patterns emerge in those answers. And once those patterns start to unearth themselves, that's going to form the basis of, you know, creating those landing pages with that copy and those design. Cause you'll, you'll, you'll know exactly the language that they're speaking and you'll be able to speak to it consistently. So that would be my suggestion when it comes to that. Julian, do you have anything to add? Yeah. I mean, without knowing, without knowing the whole context, Jennifer, um, I, it sounds, I mean, when this has come up with some of our clients, I think the, the larger issue was the lack of marketing buy-in. Um, people just not understanding what marketing marketing's role is or what it can be. Um, not really believing in marketing, thinking they're like the website people or the brochure people. That's, that's where we've had the issue of not getting customer interviews um, where we, when we have the marketing buy-in and um, we can talk to the CEO and they're bought in, that's when they happen usually. So it might be part of a larger issue. And, in terms of how do you best utilize the time, I recommend checking out an article on our blog. I forgot what it's called, but it's about customer interviews. Um, I can send it to you after. And then also uh, good resources, the book, New Sales Simplified, has a little section about questions that you can ask your customers um, to, learn, to, you know, to learn more and best utilize their time. I can send those to you after also. Um, I've got a little running list going for myself that I always use, but um, that's a good resource anyway. Yeah. Hopefully that answered that for you, Jennifer. If not, you know, let us know. Connect with us on LinkedIn too, and we'd be happy to talk with you, um, I guess, through it one-on-one -on -one if you wanted to schedule a call with Julian or myself. Be happy to, happy to help you. Um, let's see. Axel, or Alex, excuse me, do you recommend form first before accessing content, or do you provide content and put the form as a fill out more? Pay to play or free with the option for more. This is probably one of the largest questions out there right now in marketing, right? Gating versus ungating content. Um, I love this question because um, I was once in the gated camp and now I'm in the ungated camp and I've come around um, and have been fully baptized into, I would ungate all of my content if I could. Obviously for things like webinars, you're not able to, but my feeling is, what do I want more? Do I want 
this goes back to the whole prospect or, 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 or argument about lead gen versus demand gen. So if your focus is lead generation, then you're going to want to put the form in. But if you're thinking demand, which is literally having customers come to you and say, I'm ready to buy your product, you want to guarantee consumption of your content more than anything. And you're only going to guarantee consumption of it by making sure it's ungated so people can read it. So I personally fall in the camp of ungating content. Um, I know I'm not in the majority on that or or even if I even if I am in the minority, or if I'm in the majority, there's a very vocal minority saying that you should gate everything. But uh, my, my feeling is to optimize for the sales conversion. Um, I would ask for minimal amount of information if I was gating it. So let's say you had uh, an article and you wanted to build your email list, right? The best way to build your email list is going to be you can put the form in the um, in the blog so they can convert, or you can do a little exit intent pop-up form to download like a longer version of this article. Just ask for the email address and the, and the name, and that's it. Um, if, if your purpose is lead, is lead generation, you should be asking for the minimal amount of information possible so you can follow up with your newsletter or with a webinar or with something different. But I wouldn't be collecting form uh, submissions for the purpose of your sales team following up with them. That's going to close at a very low rate. Your sales team is going to dislike that and you're not going to get what you want out of your marketing efforts, which is sales. You want, you want your marketing to be helping generate revenue and that is gonna be a lot of effort put forth for not a lot of return. Yeah. And I Good, good points, Matthew. I think like you already said, just, just to put it in a nutshell again, the goal of your content is to make people love your company. And you, if your content can't do that right now, that's a whole other problem. But if you put a form between your audience and the content, then you're just making it difficult for them to consume. And then that, them reading it and then consuming it and loving your company because they just read something helpful from you that's not going to happen or you're going to make that more difficult just because you want their email address. So think about that. And I mean, obviously having their email address is a huge benefit because growing a list is having a list of people of the right people is such a huge value. Um, think about other ways you can do this. I mean, running this webinar is giving us a list. Um, if you, if you have amazing content, people will want to subscribe to it. They will want to subscribe to a weekly newsletter where you, you give out your content. So you don't need to gate your content. You can just give it out for free and people will want to come back for more. That's something else to think about. Yeah. I mean, even something like holding a small event at your guy's company and asking people to register on like Eventbrite or something like that is another way to do that as well. There's, there's other ways you can, in my opinion, grow your email list without doing that. I mean, obviously you do it through trade shows and stuff like that as well. I would use content as the medium to, to educate and to nurture and to make sure people know, like, and trust your company. Exactly. Um, let's see, Jennifer, if you only have one contact form, how often should you be calling attention to filling it out on a page? Uh, one of our developers put it after every content section and it seemed like overkill. That is an interesting question. Jennifer, are you here? I, I almost want more detail on that, on that question, if that's possible. Let's see. Um, oh, Jennifer, I'm going to actually let you come on real quick because I want more details. Is that okay? Can we, can we try that? Can we try that? Hi, Jennifer. You're muted. So if. Jennifer, if you want to add a little context for us, we'd love to hear it. Um, you just have to, you know, okay, you don't have a microphone. Oh, okay. Um, the best way I could, the best way I could answer that, I guess is, I mean, I'd have to see it to kind of give any, any real opinion on it, but I would say you should have the call to action for the form, like two to maybe three times on a landing page, but it's going to depend on how long the landing page is, right? Like if it's a long scroll landing page, you're going to want to reinforce it almost after every one of those kind of content breaks. Um, but again, it depends on how large it is or obnoxious it is. So it, it's a hard question to answer. Um, maybe, maybe Randall, you have a, you have a suggestion on that since you've, you've designed a few of those. I for sure have a hot take, Randall, if you don't. Well, <laughs> I think after every content section, it, it is probably overkill, especially if it's like a very visual, um, call to action to like go fill out that form. 
but you know there's there's also you know text links if somebody's engaged enough to actually be reading through the body copy enough and paying attention to it you can always include it in that copy and have a text link to it instead of it's you know having it be this big bold button that you see after every section and it kind of gets tiring and seems a little desperate at times maybe even um but yeah with, without seeing it or, or knowing a little bit more about it it's it's hard to say yeah hot take it just make it easy to reach out if there's a if there's if there's a contact us button on the top right i think that's all you need honestly i think if if people aren't reaching out that's that's another problem but i mean think I like to put myself in, in the shoes of a buyer. If I'm, if I want to reach out, I, I know where to find it. And most, I think most of your buyers will just make it easy to find obviously, but having a bunch of forms on your page is not going to make people reach out more often. Having great copy and having great design, that's what's going to, that's what's going to motivate people to reach out if they feel like you get them. And if they feel like that you can help them solve a problem, that's what, that's, that's where you should focus instead. And if you, if you want people to reach out, just make it easy for them. Thanks. All right. Awesome. Question from Dennis. Do buyers care about employee photos as compared to people like me? Great question. Um, this is going to go into context as far as I'm concerned. So obviously you want to highlight your end user, your customer as much as possible um, within your landing pages. But if there's a place where it's like, the contact us page. Yeah, you're gonna want to see a picture of like your sales guy, your customer service rep. If it's uh, if you if you're talking about your guy's service, yeah, you're, they're gonna want to see probably a picture of what one of your service repair techs look like, um, and kind of how they how they present themselves. So I think think about the context of the landing page all the time when um, when you go through that and ask yourself that question. And if it's more of a much more of a customer facing landing page, like. Yeah, you probably want to have a, a picture of your end user, your ideal customer, you know, sitting there like I, I'd want a picture of like a welder, like on my on my page. But if it's, you know, if I'm on a, if I'm on a conversion page, or if I'm talking about a service that I offer, I want to make sure they see what my people look like, and specifically a person at my company, like who does that role. Um, so they can have some no like trust before they convert on that. Julian, you got anything to add to that? No. Nothing to add. That's all right. Spot on. Um, let's see. Alex, what is your opinion on using tools like HubSpot's landing page creator and tying it into your website versus creating your own page to fit the bill? And Randall, I'm, I'm going to defer to you on that question. Um, I mean, I haven't used HubSpot's landing page creator but I would imagine like from a, like a design and layout perspective, it's fine. Um, Julian might have some opinions on what that does for how it works with your existing website. But um, you know, I, I don't think there's really, as long as you can get it live and it's hitting, you know, the points in our checklist that we're talking about it, like the tool that you use doesn't really, really matter. I wouldn't get too hung up on that. Yeah. I agree with that. I think you can, you can do fine either way. Um, I've seen, yeah, it kind of, it just kind of depends on your situation. I think I would probably prefer it being custom built just because there's a lot more flexibility in getting it right. But sometimes budgets or time just doesn't allow for it. So maybe sometimes the in-between solution is just using HubSpot or using a landing page builder just so you have something, you don't have to wait for budget. You don't have to wait for, approval in your company or whatever the, the issue might be. So it kind of depends. I think both are, both are okay options. Um, Jen, Jenny, Jenny Elson has a really good question about when considering video on a landing page, any suggestions for optimal length? Um, do you have, do you have anything on that, Julian? On optimal. Okay. So the question is, you know, how long should a video be on a landing, on a landing page? Yep. I mean, also depends. I, my gut would say not more than two minutes, maybe one to one, two minutes would be my, my gut feeling just from my own perspective of how much video I want to watch. But then again, if it's, if it's important information and if it's valuable information to the viewer, I don't see why they wouldn't watch a 10 minute video. 
So it, it kind of depends. You just got just make the focus on making the video valuable. And if it's short, that's fine. And if it's longer, that's okay too. I would, if I were to make one, I'd probably stick with two to three minutes. If it's educational, maybe five. Yeah, I would, uh, I would tend to agree with that. Um, I've had, I wouldn't put like a 20 minute video up there. I don't think that's necessary. You should be able to get across what you want as quickly as possible. Um, I think if you're going to have it be like a non-speaking video, it should be very short. So if it's like a video where like you're trying to show features and stuff like that, I would try to keep that at 30 seconds. If you're going to have someone talk in that video, especially if you're going to put a face on that video, I would say two to three, maybe four minutes in length is probably the best route to go. Um, let's see. So I saw Alex with a question and then William had a good one. Uh, this is uh, this is a really good one. A lot of times we use gateway content for proprietary info, like design drawings or spec information. We do this know if our competitors are accessing our content. Is this not advised? Um, all right, so there's no right or wrong answer to this, William. Really, there isn't. But I'm going to tell you, it's not advised. I I I think companies spend way too much time thinking about their competitors and not enough time thinking about their customers. And if I can make my content, even if it's my design drawings, as easy as possible for my customers to have them, guess what? I care about that more than anything in the world. So I would prioritize that over anything. Now, I know there are companies, you don't have to put all of your like proprietary information in those drawings, um, but that's definitely kind of my feeling on it. And then I would make sure easy to get a quote on that or a demo on, a, on the, um, on the follow-up. So I'm actually going to send you real quick this, uh, this company called Advanced Machine and Engineering Co. Nick, Nick Gellner, who's their sales and marketing director, who was on Joe's podcast. They actually, I would highly recommend listening to that podcast from, from Joe on the manufacturing executive because this answers this question directly because Nick, one of the things he does, he makes it every single CAD drawing, anything you want. You can get it in any format you want. He makes it available. And he does that because I know that if I can get my drawing specced into their product, that to me is, that means more to him than anything. And he, and his feeling is like, you know, my, most customers are too lazy to do that and are, and are not going to go about, you know, reverse engineering my stuff. Or if they do, who cares? They're not even going to, they're not going to make it. And like, you know, most of your customers kind of know or competitors know how your product works. They probably already bought it and taken it apart and rebuilt it. I mean, I know at Benzel, um, I did, we did that for every single product that we ever competed against. And we weren't even that good of an R&D department, in my opinion. So uh, a company with a good R&D department who does skunk works, which is what that's called. Um, yeah, I mean, they already know. So I would just, you know, I would just let them have it. Or if you really want to get fancy, you can do like an email domain blocker. So if they're going it from like a competitor email domain, you can say, hey, appreciate that. Uh, fortunately, you don't work with us, so we're not going to let you do that. I mean, if you want to get really detailed about it, you could do that. But that, that's generally my feeling about it. Julian? Two points to add to that. First of all, I think unless you verify their identity in some, some way, your competitors are going to be able to get in there anyways. They can make up a name, they can make up a company, and they'll find it anyways. And the second point to that is just by trying to prevent your competitors from finding it, you make it really difficult for all of your audience, all of your customers and potential buyers to access it. So I guess it's just weighing your options. You know, what's more important to you? Is it more important that all of your audience is able to access this information really easily and that you make, you know, you get sales from it or is it important to you that your competitors don't find it, which is probably a lot of work with questionable return. That would be my take on that. Cool. I understand why you're doing it though. I, it's not the first time I've heard this. Um, so last question I see from Alex. If you guys have any more questions, please drop them. I know we're, we're about coming up on time here. Um, Alex, follow up on the question from my previous question. If you're not gating or requiring info, how do you measure success without knowing how many people are visiting? Um, all right, so there is a way to, obviously if you use Google Analytics, you can find out how many people are visiting. I would judge success two ways. One, um, time on page, which is to me a really easy way to look at it. So if you read through your blog or your landing page and you're like, it should take a minute to two minutes to read this, and you're seeing your people are spending a minute to two minute reading it, I would say I'm willing to go through the trouble to ensure consumption of that. There's another tool that you can build 
um, on Google Tag Manager called Scroll Depth. And basically you can create your own content consumption funnel. So it basically you can build scroll depth at 50%, scroll depth at 75%, scroll depth at 100%. And so you would go to that content piece that you have in question. Maybe it's, maybe it's like a really uh, detailed one for you and say, okay, this many people visited the page, this many people scroll 50, this many people scroll 70, this many people scroll 100, and then just make that little content consumption funnel for yourself to see how effective that content is. And like, if, if, if you have 100 people going to your web, going to that landing page, and 50% of the people are getting to 50%, and 30 people are getting to 100%, you know, I would, you're gonna have to decide whether that's worth it to you or not. Um, it, it, there's really not a hard or fast rule on that. It's going to depend on how many visitors you have, but I would be willing to pay for that on Facebook to insert people download or consume, consume my content because I know it, I have a much higher percentage chance of them remembering me if they actually got something valuable from me, as opposed to if I tried to, you know, cheaply transact them with their email address for, you know, a PDF that they probably won't even read. So <laughs> I'd rather make sure they read it and remembered me than they just, you know, Perfunct in a perfunctory manner gave me their email address and I sent them an email and they never ended up opening it or downloading it. Like I can tell you personally, I haven't read an ebook in over 12 months, but I read blogs every day. So, I mean, that's just, I'm just thinking about the way people consume content now, just like this webinar, right? I mean, how many people are on this webinar? We have 43 people. We have 20 people still here. We're over an hour, 15 minutes into it. Um, you know, think about content people want to consume and how people like it. I mean, they like to be on stuff like this now. So uh, that's, that's kind of how I would, how I would approach it. Anything to add, Julian? Yeah, de definitely really good points about measuring consumption and making sure that, you know, what you're putting out there, people are actually looking at, because if nobody's looking at it, then there's no point in making it. Um, and that's another problem. But I mean, a little bit of a, just experience, based on experience at Gorilla, we can't, there's no perfect attribution for this, but we know our content marketing is working because we get, responses to our newsletters that we send out weekly or every other week where people just say, Hey, great content. Um, I've been, I've been following you guys for a year. Um, we're ready for a conversation now. We weren't before, but now we are like, how do you measure that? That's, that's really difficult. The only thing we can see is that they've opened it, each one of our emails. Um, but how do you, that you can't put that on a dashboard or you get people who say, I've been listening to your podcast. I've been on your webinars and you know, I follow you on Instagram. So they, they, we know that they're consuming all of our content, but measuring it is, is very difficult. Um, so, but, but what we can measure is that this is not a, a dashboard me metric, but we can measure and our owners are seeing that we're seeing more and more people come into Gorilla because they are consuming our content and not because we ran an ad, ad somewhere. It's because we've been consistently putting out valuable content for years now, and people have been consuming it, and we see that on our bottom line revenue. We see people buying our stuff and engaging with us because we, we put out content helping people for this long. Yeah, keep in mind how holistic the buyer's journey is. It goes across a bunch of channels. It's on their time all the time. Um, and you're not going to be able to get perfect attribution for stuff. You can get first touch and last touch. You can always get that. Um, but even then it's like, let's say someone was watching this webinar and then they read a blog and then they saw a LinkedIn ad. Um, and then they decided to go, go directly to the website and then, you know, request a demo. Well, that direct traffic thing is going to look really good and be the attribution, but was it accurate? No. I mean, they looked at a bunch of other stuff and your CRM isn't going to capture all of that. So, you know, attribution is, you know, I just, I wouldn't spend a ton of time thinking about it, to be honest, because you're going to, you could be doing way more impactful things with your time than, you know, trying to come up with the perfect attribution machine. I mean, most, most people on this webinar are not, are maybe are one or two people in their department. You know, you just don't have the time for that. Worry about the highest impact activities that you can do. Attribution is one of them. All right, guys, I don't see any more questions. So I think I'm going to call it here. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you um, for coming and spending time with us. I really appreciate it. I um, also want to really thank Randall for coming on because this is Randall's first webinar with us and for uh, giving us his UX experience. You did awesome, Randall. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you.
Um, we got another webinar here in two weeks on uh, content marketing tactics for 2021. And we're going to go through something called the content waterfall. And you guys will be highly uh, rewarded to check that out. So we'll send that out hopefully next week. And uh, I want to thank you all so much for coming on. Appreciate it. We, we know how much this, we know how much your time is worth to you. So if we're not giving you value, we're definitely not doing our job. So uh, please let us know in the future, any things you'd like us to cover as a topic, we'd be very, very happy to, um, to look at it and, and, and consider it. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys in two weeks. Have a great start to your week. Go kick some butt and we'll hopefully see you in two weeks. Bye guys. All right. Thank yeah. you all.